everyone and welcome to webinar Wednesday I'm your host Jessica King and I just wanted to thank you quickly for joining us today um, are your stomach pains affecting your daily routine or seem to always be happening after you eat well it could be related to your digest digestive system today we'll have internal medicine physician dr. Shane McGee discuss how what you put in your body has an overall effect on your health here's a little more info on today's speaker Dr. McGee is board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine. His clinical interests include hypertension, diabetes, and care of chronic conditions. He joined Kelsey Siebold in September of 2016, which means you're coming up on your one year anniversary. Up on one year. Congrats. Um, and he practices at the Tanglewood Clinic location. Don't forget, we'll be taking any questions that you have at the end of the webinar. If a question happens to pop up, just type it into your question box, and we'll do our best to address it after Dr. McGee's presentation. Uh, and now I'll turn it over to you, Dr. McGee. All right. Uh, thank you, Jessica. As she said, I'm an internist at Kelsey Siebold. Uh, forgive me if I talk too fast. Jessica's going to help me stay uh, talking at an appropriate speed, but, so, but we'll get started without much further ado. So what does the gut do? The gut is one of the biggest organs in the body. And if you include the bacteria in your gut, it is the biggest organ in your body. When, we talk, when physicians talk about the gut, we talk about everything from the mouth to the anus. So that's quite, and everything in between. So that's quite a lot of organs. Um, we, it's the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach. From the stomach, the food goes to the small intestine, and then the large intestine, or the colon, and then to the rectum and out the anus. And along the way, you have a few other helper organs, uh, the liver and the pancreas, to kind of help digest the food. We'll talk a little bit more about most of these in detail on the following slides. So a uh, quick uh, comment on the gut. Does the gut grow? The answer is yes. When you're a baby, the gut is the size of a marble, and it quickly grows uh, to, uh, can so it can take in more food. Unfortunately, the gut never really shrinks. I know people talk about um, they got to starve themselves so you can shrink the gut, so then they'll be eating less food later on. That doesn't really happen, unfortunately, unless you get the um, unless you get certain uh, procedures that can sh uh, shrink the gut to help you lose weight, and those are indicated in people if you have complications of obesity or if you're overweight to a certain degree that people qualify for these surgeries. Your stomach size is not correlated with your weight. In fact, there's a variety of even shapes and sizes of stomachs that are considered normal for people of all different uh, shapes and sizes. And just because you have a big stomach does not mean you're going to uh, be obese. Uh, that has more to do with the hormones released from the stomach when you eat. I mentioned it earlier, uh, if you include the bacteria in your gut, then the gut is the biggest organ in the body. Uh, the gut helps neutralize toxic byproducts of digestion. It helps regulate your immune system. It shows bad pathogens and bad bacteria to your immune system, so your immune system can learn how to fight these bacteria. Um, sometimes we talk about probiotics. Uh, these are good bacteria you can get through certain types of yogurt that can help kind of regulate the gut microbiome. The microbiome is the, all of the bacteria that consist, it, it exist in your gut. It helps you break down medications and helps you absorb medications, including vitamins uh, such as uh, B and K. Very complex. Uh, I even had one neurologist in medical school one time uh, tell me the gut is just as important as the brain. There are just as many neurons in the gut as in the brain, so very important. You are what you eat. Uh, what you eat affects the way your body, uh, way you feel about your body, and affects your mood too. There are certain foods that challenge your digestive system and can throw it out of whack. The foods that cause inflammation. We will talk some about these in the next uh, few slides. But stuff, the fattier foods generally uh, cause more inflammation, and make you feel worse. So trying to maintain a healthy digestive system. Uh, fiber is key to it. So eat a diet high in fiber, vegetables, legumes, and fruits. And if you want to get a sense for how much vegetables to eat, uh, you look at your hand, and that's how much uh, vegetables you should put on your plate, the size of the entire hand. Um, we talk about fiber as, as two types of fiber, soluble and insoluble. Insoluble, insoluble fiber um, doesn't really get absorbed very well at all and kind of gives bulk to your stools. And if you're having issues with stool bulk, it can help. The sol soluble fiber kind of gets absorbed, helps pull water into that stool, and also helps you be more regular. 
Fiber is a very important thing. Fiber is a complex carbohydrate, so you can get some of these fibers even from the whole grains, which although we don't like the simple grains, the uh, processed grains like the white rice, white sugar, uh, white bread, the whole grains have fiber in them can help as well. You want to limit the high fatty foods in your diet um, the, uh, for a few reasons. A, fat adds to your waistline, not good for that. Increases inflammation, not good for that. And it also sticks around in your stomach for a very long time, the fatty foods. Um, and if it sticks around the stomach for a long time, your stomach builds up more acid. And as uh, more acid builds up, you might have symptoms of gastritis or a, a reflux, which is a burning pain in the stomach or the esophagus. I mentioned probiotics earlier. You can get this from the low-fat yogurts and the kefir. I particularly like Greek yogurts. Greek yogurts have a lot of protein in them. Protein makes you feel full, so you're going to want to eat less by uh, tricking your body with that protein as well. So even a small amount of protein. Again, it's not about how much you eat, that sensation of fullness necessarily. It's about what you eat. So eating protein can help make you feel full and it helps with the uh, regulate the gut microbiome. We're really learning a lot more about the gut microbiome as time goes on and we're finding how really important it is and how good probiotics may or may not be. So there is more to come on that in the future as we learn more. Um, other issues in maintaining a healthy digestive system, uh, one, the most com one of the most common complaints I see is constipation. The best thing for constipation is staying hydrated and exercise. You're never going to get away from these things. Staying hydrated, at least a few water bottles, six or five or six water bottles, same size water bottles a day is probably enough water assuming you don't sweat a lot. Exercise regularly. I am at heart a primary care doctor. Exercise helps with almost every organ system including the gut. Um, we recommend 30 minutes, five days a week of uh, cardiac exercise. And then smoking, liquor, caffeine, these can all cause digestive problems in the gut, sometimes even lead to certain cancers in the gut, particularly the smoking and the excessive liquor. I know there was a recent study out, study out uh, showing caffeine helped increase longevity, but as with anything, it does come with side effects. Um, it, can make you, it makes you feel like you have to go to the bathroom more often, can cause abdominal cramping. Um, so, uh, but it does, there may have other health benefits as well. So take everything in moderation. Uh, eating on schedule can help. Uh, if, you're, if you have struggle with overeating, eating on schedule, certain amounts to keep from be getting too hungry and then overeating at times. Uh, when we talk about snacks, we mean the healthy snacks. We mean the whole fruits. The whole fruits have good fiber in them. The canned fruits and fruit drinks, lots and lots of sugar, not good for you. Sugar leads to inflammation, weight gain, diabetes. Uh, not very good things. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, the gut has just as many neurons as the brain. It means it's highly sensitive to stress, anxiety, depression. If you suffer from these things, it can take it out on your gut. So managing your stress is going to be very important if you suffer, suffer from uh, some frequent GI issues. The gut affects the rest of the body. Uh, an healthy gut, gut and digestive tract can lead to other organs in your body becoming unhealthy, such as the heart, the gallbladder, the liver, the colon. There's more on this on future slides. I'm happy to take questions about some of these on later slides as well. Um, the most common complaint about the chest uh, pain caused from the gut is uh, gastroesophageal reflux, a burning pain. This can be very easily confused with heart disease or heart attack. Sometimes it can feel the exact same. One key feature to distinguish your heart from your gut, if it gets worse with exercise, it, uh, it's more likely to be your heart, so you may want to talk to your doctor about that. Uh, it is very common to experience heartburn every once in a while, especially if you have a very fatty food and then go straight to bed. Heartburn is going to be more likely. How, these are the symptoms of heartburn. Um, uh, a gastroesophageal reflux, a persistent heartburn, that burning pain in the chest, tooth erosion, bad breath, nausea, sometimes what we call early satiety, which is getting full too quickly off of food, uh, can also be a sign of heartburn or gastritis in the stomach. Rarely is it a sign of, a, of an infection, but if you have these things, it's worthwhile getting looked at. If you are losing weight and have fevers and have trouble swallowing with heartburn, that may be a sign you need uh, some more intense uh, diagnostic procedures, such as an endoscopy, we can talk about in a second. 
Um, so the treatment for GERD, first line, always first line, is lifestyle changes. You can make yourself so much healthier by just changing things you do in, in your life. So avoiding foods and drinks that trigger symptoms. Fatty foods are notorious for causing heartburn. Notorious because fatty foods, like I mentioned earlier, they stick in the gut. It takes a while for your body to absorb fatty foods. You have to get the pancreas and the liver involved. That takes time. So avoiding fatty foods can help prevent uh, gastroesophageal reflux symptoms and heartburn. You can take over-the-counter antacids. Tums works in it, it really quickly. Um, Zantac is also a very good one. Zantac is a medication that actually reduces stomach acid uh, in your body, uh, but it's over-the-counter. Of course, we do have stronger medications uh, we can offer you in clinic if uh, such a net is necessary. Surgery happens occasionally for heartburn. However, it's getting more and more rare today as our medications get better and better. These surgeries we used to do were quite big and intensive. It didn't always work. So it is a uh, last resort, um, but it can be useful in the right patient. Uh, the uh, gallbladder, so the gall after the stomach, uh, you go to the small bowel and the gallbladder kind of hooks up to the small bladder, a small bowel, and it, it secretes enzymes bile that helps you absorb fat and certain vitamins. Uh, so uh, important, but the liver makes these enzymes and it gets stored in the gallbladder. So people who have a gallbladder taken out for one reason or another, you're still going to do fine. Almost no difference uh, from the average person. Uh, the gallbladder just helps uh, give you a squeeze that out uh, when, you, when you do uh, eat certain types of food, particularly the fatty foods. Gallstones are hard deposits that form in your gallbladder when there's too much cholesterol or waste in your bile. People at risk for gallstones are uh, female, overweight, being middle-aged, and uh, certain ethnicities have a higher risk of gallstones. Gallstones by themselves may not cause any problems. What causes problems is when they get into the neck of the gallbladder, the gallbladder tries to squeeze and it can't get anything out. So when they cause a blockage, the gallstones cause problems. And, you know, at the very least, it's going to cause you some pain whenever you eat. Uh, the very worst, you can actually get infections and inflammation behind that, and that can be life-threatening. If that's the case, you need the gallbladder taken out uh, rather quickly. Um, there are medicines we can, if you don't have that worst case, there are medicines to help try to dissolve the stones, but a lot of times they do end up taking the gallbladder out. The surgeries for this can be minor if everything goes well. Um, so I mentioned the liver makes the enzymes that are stored in the gallbladder to help push out, uh, to help absorb some fats. The liver also helps uh, make protein in the body, helps regulate your immune system. Uh, it is damaged by fat, so being overweight and obese can lead to liver damage. We call it fatty liver or non-alcoholic hepatitis. Um, you can also, alcohol, well known to cause liver damage, especially in great quantity over great time. So it's not going to happen overnight, but can happen over time. Certain medications we do cause, the, we use cause liver damage as well. If you have questions about these medications, you should talk to your doctor about them and see if it's appropriate for your liver. Tylenol, for instance, over the counter, if used appropriately, never cause, or hardly ever causes liver damage. If overused or abused, it can cause liver damage. Let your doctor know if you're using that. Viral hepatitis, uh, A, B, and C, but B and C really are the ones that can cause liver failure eventually if left untreated. In fact, we recommend all adults born between 1945 and 1965 being tested for hepatitis C uh, because it's very, very treatable now. And then health supplements. There are many, many health supplements. They Hardly any of them have been well studied, um, but a lot of them are known to cause liver damage. So be very, very, very careful if you use health supplements. So going from the stomach to the small bowel with the liver and the uh, gallbladder, then the next stop would be the uh, large bowel or the colon. Uh, the function of the colon is to, f to finish absorbing with the small uh, bowel did So a lot of it's absorbing uh, fluids. Not a lot of major nutrients get absorbed in the large bowel, but a lot of fluids do. Um, common problems associated with the colon include constipation, diverticulitis, or Losis, which is bleeding, diverticulitis, which is inflammation of pouches, uh, of the large bowel of the colon, and then colon cancer, which is, of course, preventable and treatable if we catch it early. 
uh, diverticulosis can be, it's a pa outpouching of the colon. From, you can think of it as too much pressure making the colon bulge out. Uh, it can be prevented by eating a diet high in fiber and going to the bathroom regularly, trying to stay regular. Um, so a colonoscopy, make sure you get your routine checkups. For the average person at average risk of colon cancer, the first colonoscopy is at the age of 50. And then, if it's normal, 10 years thereafter. Now, in the United States, we like doing colonoscopies because we can check precancers and we can remove them. We can find early cancers and remove them. So we like colonoscopies. However, uh, we can also check for blood in the stool. We would do that yearly if we need to. Uh, we, again, we can't tell you why you're bleeding. We just can tell you need a colonoscopy if we check for blood in the stool. And of course, if you have a family history of colon cancer or a personal history of colon cancer or certain genetic syndromes, such as Lynch syndrome or HNPCC, hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer syndrome, it's a mouthful. If you have these syndromes, you need to talk to your doctor. You may need earlier screening colonoscopies. The colonoscopy is a procedure where we stick a, we put a camera up your bottom and take a picture of the entire colon. The colonoscopy procedure itself is actually not that bad. As bad as it sounds, it's not that bad. The, uh, it's very quick. We do give you some anesthesia, so we, some people don't even remember having it done to them. Uh, and you get a ride home that day, and your ride is running the next day. Um, so the, what people complain about most is the uh, prep. So we give you a medicine to make you clean out your colon, and that's the most uncomfortable part of that, but you do that at home and the safety of your own home. I mentioned upper endoscopy earlier, or EGD, esophageal gastroduodenoscopy, you might see written down. This is where we stick the camera through your mouth and take a picture of your esophagus and your stomach. Particularly, we're looking for ulcers or infections or signs of bleeding. The infection we look for most often is going to be Helicobacter pylori, which is associated with some stomach cancers and infections. Uh, we can actually do a breath test for that as well. So nowadays, you don't always even have to do an endoscopy to diagnose that. But endoscopies are still very commonly done and very useful in the right situation. We do not need to do this for every cause of abdominal pain. Some things can be treated simply with antacids, like I talked about earlier. And with that, are there any questions? I'll, I'll spend the next few minutes answering questions that may crop up. I'm going to start us off. Um, I'm going to kind of go back to a diet question. What are your thoughts on cleanses? Are they good for your body, mm. bad for your body? So I, I don't often like cleanses. I don't think they uh, offer a lot of benefit, mainly because we're, I'm looking for lifelong habits, right? Cleanses are short-term do them for a week or two, and that's pretty much all anybody can stand of doing a cleanse. And you don't develop good habits. I prefer eating a healthy diet, one that's low in fats, high in fiber, high in vegetables, and fresh fruits, uh, a little bit of lean meat, and a smaller portion of carbohydrates. So I'm not a big fan of cleanses. So I have a question talking about ice cream. If ice, if ice cream upsets the stomach, could that be a, a lactose issue? The answer is yes. Many, many people, the majority of the world has lactose intolerance or some degree of it. It is not natural to be, can be consuming a lot of lactose for most people. So yes, a, a ice cream issue could be a sign of lactose intolerance. We can offer tests in the office, but often the simple treatment is to avoid dairy. Um, they do make dairy-free um, milks or lactose-free milks and ice cream, so that may be something worth trying. So I have a question about fatty liver syndrome. This is a, a kind of a new disease on the block. We're learning more and more about it. Uh, so what happens? Is fatty liver dangerous? What do we do about it? So fatty liver, uh, a few things. It may never cause a problem. However, we can see uh, end-stage cirrhosis, uh, which is liver failure, from fatty liver disease. Now, you can talk to your doctor if you're at risk for that, because there are some calculations we can perform using your uh, liver enzymes and age and whatnot to figure out how at risk you are for developing liver disease or cirrhosis. Um, so yes, uh, it is a risk factor for that. And this solution, the first solution is to lose weight and eat right. There are some medications we're studying that may offer some benefit for fatty liver, 
Um, but you should really talk to your doctor if those are appropriate for you. Those are kind of new. We're learning more about it all the time. That's kind of the big topic among gastroenterologists and at conferences, what to do about this. Uh, but the best piece of advice right now is to um, try to eat better and try to lose some weight. I see a question about diverticulitis. Um, what treatment is used for diverticulitis? So, the standard of care for diverticulitis is uh, different from diverticulosis is going to be uh, antibiotics and kind of moderating what you eat. We used to think nuts, for instance, can lead to episodes of diverticulitis and inflammation. But the standard of care for diverticulitis is antibiotics. Now, there is some thought that not everybody needs antibiotics, particularly mild cases, there is some thought you may not need antibiotics. But you, if you think you have diverticulitis, you should talk to your doctor about that because oftentimes we still do a short course of antibiotics. And worst case scenario, it does require hospitalization. And even worse than that, sometimes it does require taking part of your colon out for diverticulitis. Now that's different from diverticulosis, which often gets confused. Diverticulosis is bleeding and that outpouching. What happens is that it pushes out so much, puts pressure on the blood vessels and can cause bleeding. So a lot of times for diverticulosis, um, we, uh, it happens and then you get better on your own and we, it never happens again. However, if you have bleeding from diverticulosis, we have to check you for colon cancer. We do not want to miss a colon cancer. And then talk to you about the high fiber diet and avoiding nuts, for instance, for diverticulosis. Another question, is it best to avoid gluten in the diet? So gluten is a natural protein uh, often found in many plants. Um, unless your glut gluten uh, have um, celiac disease or some level of gluten intolerance, then gluten should not matter for your diet. For the average healthy person, it's not going to impact your diet in any great way. And I would say vegetables uh, are, are good. A weak whole, wheats are, you know, and they have carbs in them. You've got to be careful from the carbs. I'm worried about the carbs and less worried about the gluten for most people. Celiac disease is, um, is different and it can cause major, major problems. So if you think you have celiac disease, you should certainly see your uh, doctor about that. You can get tested for celiac disease if you're gluten intolerant, correct? Yes, you can get tested for celiac disease. Oftentimes the first test is a blood test looking for a specific antibody uh, that we see elevated in people with celiac disease. So very easy to get tested for it. Um, so what makes your stomach swell after eating or drinking? What can I do to stop the swelling? Uh, so uh, sometimes uh, that can be a few different reasons. Most commonly is the types of food you're eating, the gassy, the foods that make lots of gas. Uh, so uh, milk, for one, uh, can make lots of gas in, in your stomach. Carbonated beverages that have gas in them can do it. Um, simple sugars can do it. So eating less of these foods can help prevent your stomach from swelling to some degree. Uh, some, uh, sometimes you, you might see swelling uh, uh, when you have infections like Helicobacter pylori. You can get tested for that if it's becoming a big problem, swelling and bloating. Um, and that is an infection we would use antibiotics for. Uh, sometimes we can't find a cause. Um, it could be a sign of something like an irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, and there are a variety of medications we can try for that. Uh, if you talk to your doctor, that seems to be uh, the case. Um, that, that, unfortunately, could be a hard one to treat sometimes. But try it eating a, a low in fat, low in carb diet can often help with that as well. Um, do I have a brand of probiotic that I recommend? And not a particular brand. The best evidence is for probiotics containing lactobacillus. So if you look on the back and you see the bacteria in there is lactobacillus. That's L-A-C-T-O-B-A-C-I-L-L-U-S, I believe. Uh, that one has some of the most evidence for helping. Um, but like I said, there are, or, there are a million uh, probiotics out there, and there's a, there's a million bacteria out there. We have not studied every single uh, bacteria. So if you want to try a probiotic, I would probably recommend one containing lactobacillus, but knowing there's not a lot of evidence yet. Would I recommend a daily probiotic to help your digestion? If you're having problems with your digestion, I would recommend a trial of it. Uh, so uh, yes, if you're not having any problems with your digestion, I don't think the evidence is there to do it uh, quite yet, but it has been shown to help people with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, that's IBD, irritable bowel syndrome, that's IBS, and it helps prevent certain GI infections. So if you're having issues with your gut, I would recommend trying an, a, a probiotic. 
but I wouldn't go so far as to recommend otherwise healthy people doing it at this time. So you say that yogurt is good for you, however, what if you're lactose intolerant? So they do have probiotic pills out there, which you can get from a lot of pharmacies, which I don't think have lactose in them. Uh, you know, I'm not familiar if there are dairy-free uh, yogurt-type products. Uh, so, no, I would look for the, if you're interested in trying the probiotic, there are the probiotic pills that you can consider doing. Um, here's a question. Um, is it okay to oh. use GERD over-the-counter medicines on a daily basis? Is too, the, mm -hmm. is, how often is too often? So it, it, I like telling people to try it for two months when I put them on a prescription strength uh, GERD medication for two months and then trying to get you off. Long term, there are some issues with them. Uh, however, if you have if you're symptomatic long term, it may be worth uh, continuing them uh, long term. However, there are issues that arise, so it messes with acid in your gut. So sometimes, uh, if you mess with acid in your gut, it messes with the way you absorb important nutrients like B12, like iron. Now, this takes a long time of being on these medications for this to really cause that to happen. But it may be worthwhile getting these levels checked if you've been on for a while. Check your B12, check your iron, see if you have that issue. It's easy to replace them if you cannot get off your antacid. Uh, secondly, there is some data coming out that uh, using antacids cause it messes uh, with the, uh, the immune the way your body, uh, your immune system in your body since your stomach is so important in that. It can increase your chances of certain types of pneumonia and certain types of diarrheal infections. So I um, that is a consideration, uh, and if you're starting to get frequent pneumonias or frequent, frequent diarrheal infections, like Clostridium difficile being the big one, maybe you can consider stopping taking it. However, um, that means you're not going to get the protective effect from it. Your heartburn may get worse or your ulcer may get worse. So that is a risk-benefit analysis to have with your doctor, but there are risks to being on it too long. And I'm going to round out our questions on a supplement question. You said that some health supplements can damage your liver, correct? Yes. Um, what about fiber supplements for people? Mm. Fiber supplements do not actually damage your liver. They are often also the first line I pick for people having constipation or loose stools that are not infectious because they can add bulk to your stool and they can help... Uh, one, and they can also put more fluid in the stool to help push it out. So fiber supplements are really great. They decrease the inflammation in your stool. They make it harder to absorb some of the simple sugars. So you may, uh, it's not going to help you lose weight, but it may help you absorb certain fats uh, paired with a healthy diet. So I think fiber supplements are fantastic. That is one dietary supplement which is good. You can find it in Metamucil. You can find it in celery. So very, very good. All right. Well, that is going to end our questions. We're right on schedule here. Um, and that is going to conclude our webinar. And I want to say a very big thank you to you, Dr. McGee, for doing such a great job. My and pleasure. of course, thanks to all of you for joining us this month. Um, we hope the information that you received keeps your body happy and healthy, and you'll be able to use it in your future. And be sure to join us for our next webinar, which is uh, Wednesday, August 2nd, back to school, back to routines with pediatrician Dr. Catherine Wright. And you can tune in to see the best ways to get your kids back to their regular school year routine after their summertime. Don't forget to follow us on social media and join in on the conversation. And thanks again for tuning in. We'll talk to you all next month.